from having grown up in the business, watched your father and your grandfather, how did you know you had the skills that would make you a successful editor? You knew what you probably didn't want to do, but how did you know you had the temperament, the patience, ability to be alone in an editing room? I didn't. I, did, I didn't know. Um, I just knew I loved movies and I loved editing. Um, but when I was working in my father's trailer house, I, I started to get a, a pretty good understanding of, of what um, was required of, of an editor. Uh, he even let me work on some, you know, promo reels and sizzle reels and a couple of trailers, even when I was just sort of like schlepping stuff. So, you know, I was really able to get my hands dirty. Um, but I had him over my shoulder to, you know, kind of tell me where to cut, essentially, when I, when I, when, when I was lost. Um, and again, you know, because I had been playing with those splicers and the 35 millimeter film and the tape and the rewinds since I was a little boy, there was, there was sort of just like an inner knowledge. I just, I just was confident in, in the mechanics. Um, y you know, what really sort of became, you know, the challenge and the learning experience was, was learning, you know, about, you know, story and, and, and how to tell stories. And although I didn't uh, have a formal film school education, I uh, took a lot of night classes, uh, particularly at UCLA Extension. And uh, I studied, um, y you know, I studied uh, story, uh, screenwriting uh, classes. Uh, but more importantly, I, I, I studied a lot of theater classes and, you know, learned about the, the great plays and sort of did some, you know, took some critical analysis classes and things like that at night. And, um, you know, that's the thing that you kind of have to learn as you go if you don't have a formal film school education. And um, also, I think it's really important that you trust your gut, you know, as an editor. And I think that a lot of editors will tell you that a lot of it is instinctual. Um, you know, uh, from everything from when a performance doesn't seem to be, you know, playing to when a scene doesn't seem to be playing to when an act doesn't seem to be playing to when the whole movie doesn't seem to be playing. I mean, you really break it down, uh, you know, to individual, you can break it down to a small an element as an individual shot. Uh, so, you know, that, that really came over time and, and, and luckily I did have excellent mentors who, you know, pulled no punches and were very blunt about uh, what works and what doesn't work for them. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, that was part of the business on film that we kind of don't have as much anymore. I, I think maybe some editors work that way, but because of digital, we're much more siloed and we work in, 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 in separate sort of rooms and assistants are very busy with their chores um, a lot of it has, has be, for assistance, has become metadata management, uh, working on the computer, input, output, you know, tracking, things like that. Whereas, you know, when you were a first assistant on film, sometimes you would just stand next to the editor as he or she were editing, and you'd be handing them film because otherwise they'd have to turn around and that would break their thread and things like that. And, you, you know, it was a much more sort of interactive process between an assistant and an editor. And you, you know, literally sit over their shoulder and watch them, you know, create cuts. So, you know, that's kind of the way I was taught about performance and, and, and storytelling and, uh, you know, taste uh, in terms of, you know, what, what might be best or most appropriate in a, in a scene. Uh, did I answer your question? You did. Um, so having grown up in the industry and, and also there was this like instinctual thing because you'd been around the mechanics of it, was there anything where it surprised you where you were not sure that it was the right career for you? Whatever it was, whether I will tell you that, yeah, I will tell you there, there was a point when um, early on uh, when, you know, videotape was becoming very prevalent 
And people were, uh, video editors were these people who seemed like um, a combination of mathematicians and science nerds. And I am not either. Uh, I have a great respect for science, but I, I'm not a scientist. Uh, and, and there was a lot of numbers, always having to punch in time code numbers and things like that with the videotape and then rolling back and forth and not being able to like just put a cut in there. Uh, into the videotape, you know, like you could with film, you know, because I, I came from film. And, y you know, I, I was worried because I thought videotape is the future, you know, and Francis Ford Coppola was cutting films on videotape. And, and, and I was thinking, oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm in a pickle here because I really don't like this stuff. Um, I really like the 35 millimeter or 16 millimeter movieolas and, and, you know, what I had grown up with. And, uh, but as, as um, you know, things would, would come to pass, uh, I was working on a film called Little Man Tate with Lindsay Klingman, who, uh, you know, was another mentor and an amazing editor. And I got a phone call from my father, who had kind of semi-retired, but I think he was still sort of doing something, screwing around maybe a little bit here and there. And he said, they're cutting, uh, they're cutting films on hard drives now. And I'm like, what? what? What are you talking about? And he's all, you, you know, you've got to see this. And I had kind of heard about this and was kind of ignoring it because I was too busy working on a film. Uh, but then I ran into some people and they talked about a couple of different systems that were out there. But then, I can't remember who, I think it was my dad said, there's this thing called the Avid. And it's a computer-based editing system. And I said, get out of town. And concurrently, while working on Little Man Tate, Jodie Foster had this beautiful color screen Macintosh in her office. And uh, I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. I had a computer at home, but it was an old IBM clone. And um, uh, Jody was very cool about it. She was like, yeah, you can play with that one, you know, whenever you want, you know, you can kind of screw around on that. And so I was kind of like screwing around on the Macintosh and I was just so, you know, hypnotized by the graphical user interface. It was, it was like a video game to me, uh, although I don't play video games. But anyhow, um, so we go to see a demo. My dad and I go to see a demo of the Avid Media Composer. And in an instant, I saw that that was my future. This was the future of editing. And because it was nonlinear, it was the same as film, except it was on the computer. You didn't have to, it wasn't like videotape, which was, uh, you know, which was linear and you had to, you know, re-record the entire sequence if you wanted to make a change in one place. So, um, yeah, it was, I would say, to, to say it was like a bolt of lightning would be an understatement. I literally, you know, would look at those movieolas after that and say, these things are dinosaurs and they are destined for the, for the dust, dustbin of history or they, the, <laughs> anyway. Uh, and, and so after that, I, I basically took a year off to kind of work with my dad again and immerse myself into digital technology and the Avid Media Composer. I'm sorry, what year was this? Little Man Tate was what, 1990? Okay. Yeah. Wow. So was this at like a hotel? Like where did they have this? Community? No, uh, Avid had offices in Burbank. Oh, I see. And um, they had started to make inroads in commercials because the images, the digital images at that time were very pixelated. They almost looked like a dolly painting. Uh, and, you know, that was the thing. Well, you know, the, this is great, but we're not going to cut features like this, you know. So, uh, and of course the salespeople there and the representatives there were like, well, yes, but the next generation of, of picture quality is gonna be much better. And, you know, like, well, fine, fine, fine. And it wasn't ready for prime time in features, but people were using it for commercials. And I said, I need to learn everything I can about this because this is coming, this is the future. This is how I'm gonna be an editor, if I'm gonna be an editor indeed. And, um, and the picture quality did improve. And uh, I spent a lot of time immersing myself into the Macintosh operating system 
and the hardware that made the Macintosh operating system work, uh, which was pretty foreign to me. I mean, I wasn't a computer you know, engineer or anything like that. I, uh, I, you know, frightened of it just like anybody else and oh my God, am I gonna erase everything and things like that. But I spent really, literally almost a year um, getting my hands dirty. And you know, after that year, I, I had no fear, and I could pull apart a computer, and um, I was ready to. I was ready to go. Having that experience, how does that going forward? When you see a new technology or or a hint of it, you read about it in the Wall Street Journal, whatever. How does that make you feel? Because so many people could shun it and say, "Oh, that'll never happen." Like they said, Amazon, "Oh, that that'll fail." You know, that that'll never take off. And it's it's changed the world. It's changed how we consume things. But so many people in the beginning did. You know, how how does that make you look at things now? Well, it's different now because um, you know that was the beginning of the of the computer era, for personal computer era, it, and uh, it was also the beginning of the era of computer editing, and the adoption of 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 editing in that in that manner. Um, everything is done on the computer now. So uh, I, 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 I look at it with, uh, you know, with interest. I mean, I remember when somebody told me about Uber and he said, Uber, this is the next big thing. And I'm like, uh-huh. And I mean, it was years before I even understood what Uber was. <laughs> I didn't really like. So I mean, you know, in terms of our industry, I think there's still a lot of exciting things because what's happening is, you know, the products continue to get more powerful and cheaper, and um, you know, things to make films continue to get more powerful and and relatively cheaper, and um, I, I get excited by that kind of stuff. Uh, I I've always been excited by the idea of being able to put technology in, in more people's hands. And have and and have people, you know, uh, all kinds of people, have a voice in in, in the media creation industries. Uh, so, but you know, AI and uh, and uh, y you know, uh, virtual reality and 3D. I mean, you know, I've seen 3D come like three or four times in my lifetime. So come and go. So. IMAX, uh, you know, I think IMAX is is great for y you know what it is, but uh, do I think that's going to change or take over the entire industry or have any kind of real lasting impact? I'm not sure. You know, there's all kinds of stuff out there. Uh, I I imagine that some of them are going to kind of really take hold. Some of these more immersive technologies, but uh, I don't know. You're making me feel very old fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I was just wondering if it made you. Uh, sorry, <laughs> it wasn't my. It wasn't my intention. No, that's but okay. does it make you feel like less of a skeptic or more so? Because you like that's true. Like, I think was it um, in, even in the fifties they had the three D glasses or and then with jaws and these different things and 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 we weren't really sitting around wearing them and then we were told we were going to. But but different things where where this is going to be the new the new wave. Does it make you more of a skeptic or less so? Because you saw well, that. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that I didn't uh, want to get into the commercial advertising business, uh, one of the reasons I didn't want, was because there's so much hype, you know. And, and I'm skeptical of hype. You know, I, I like to, you know, if I see a technology that I, I, that I think is going to really, you know, sort of bear fruit or empower people or be fantastic, um, you know, I'll check it out and I'll really, like, kind of get into it. Um, but, you know... The next big thing, I'll give you an example. There's, uh, there's a project up at Stanford, which is, and I think Adobe's involved in it, where they're experimenting with artificial intelligence as it applies to editing. And, um, you know, there was some hubbub about it uh, last year. And do I think artificial intelligence is going to replace editors? Probably not in the not in in the near future. Will it will it maybe augment editing at some point in time? Uh, probably. Uh, 
you know, I think that there's kind of like a lot of hype about artificial intelligence uh, in general. I, I don't, you know, I think that's kind of overblown to tell you the truth. That's just my opinion. Um, I, I, I don't think that there's um, going to be anything that's going to obsolete us humans anytime soon. I think probably get a lot of help from computers, continue to get a lot of help. But I, I also think that there's, you know, that humans operate on a different kind of level uh, in terms of consciousness and things like that, that the computers just don't have. And uh, no one has, has shown me otherwise. Uh, so I don't know, you know, nothing that exciting has, has come along. But what is exciting is the improvement of the tools for what I deal with. Uh, you know, for digital editing, uh, for filmmaking. Uh, so, so I'm excited about that stuff.